It's the KQ Morning Show, 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It is Wednesday, January the 10th. How are we? Who, baby? <laughs> oh, good morning. I'm on fire. Man, did you even go to bed last night? No, no, <laughs> no, not at all. Just, just rolling through, playing through, I believe, would be the golf uh, lexicon, uh, the, the terminology we would use. Mm-hmm. Big night last night, a lot of fun. A little rock show I participated in. I happened to find myself on the West Coast. I'm in Los Angeles. And guess what? It's four o'clock here. And well, the show went on kind of late and one thing leads to another. And suddenly I'm like, time to go to work. Let's go. Oh, this is this is mid eighties, late night, early morning, Steve. Yeah. Let's go. God, I remember back in the day you talk about those eighties, nineties for me on the KQ morning show. Uh just getting started and going through a divorce. So I'm back in the game, the party <laughs> game, right? Oh sure. And I would have buddies, I would be looking at my watch going, Uh oh, guys, uh, someone's gonna drop me off at work at the radio station. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. been about twenty years since I've tried to pull one. I couldn't physically do it now. How are you feeling? Uh, no, I'm good. I, I, I didn't actually pull the, the true all-nighter. I thought I was going to, and then I closed my eyes and looked up 45 minutes later and went, oh, my God, I'm late, and then just came raging into the studio here. Uh, great night last night in Hollywood. I played this gig. We talked about it yesterday. Um, a, a night of ACDC, a night of celebration of, for the great Bon Scott. This is the fourth time we've done one of these. It's always a roving cast of guys from a bunch of rock bands and a bunch of stand-up comedians who also play music, and we get together. There's some comedy, and then there's just a rock show purely for fun, and last night was was absolutely great. Uh, the core like house band for most of the set, uh, me on drums, uh, Mike Inez playing bass, Allison Chain's bassist since 1993. Yeah. Before that, though, I'm sure... Candace knows all about his term of duty, tour of duty with the Ozzy Osbourne band. He was hired in 1989. I asked Mike last night, I said, well, how did you get that Ozzy gig? And he's like, man, I'm just a guy from the Valley and they auditioned 50 bassists and I went in there and they hired me. I couldn't believe it. He was in a band at that time called Skin on Skin, <laughs> played with Ozzy for like 14 minutes and then they just hired him on the spot. Wow. And three weeks later, he was playing Wembley Stadium. Wow. <laughs> he had never played, a, he had never played like a club more than 300 people. And wow. he's at uh, Wembley Stadium with Ozzy. Three weeks later, awesome dude. Uh, Billy Rowe, who's from Buck Cherry, a great guitarist named Josh Z. His band, the Mother Truckers, and a lot of other people. He's a L.A. guy, Bay Area guy that, I mean, he's played a lot in both uh, areas. Everybody knows him, and he's like the Angus for the night. He's the guy who just does Angus. And it's incredible, just an absolute blast. And then Scott Ian, because you need a third guitarist, of course, uh, to cover the two guitars in ACDC. Scott Ian from Anthrax is on stage. We're having a blast. And then and then a bunch of people sit in. Uh, 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 Dave Lombardo from um, Slayer, great, incredible drummer. Uh, Josh Freeze, who's now with the Foo Fighters, but who's yeah. played with played with Westerberg for years, the Replacements, uh, quote-unquote, reunion tour. A lot of great, a lot of great... Um, uh, musicians, Bill Burr, Dean Del Rey, uh, both did comedy. It's an awesome night. Everybody has a blast. Backstage afterwards, milling around, nothing crazy. Everybody, no one's, I mean, there's there's a little bit of drinking, but like no big deal. Very sedate, except for there's a couple there. And I asked a few people and everyone's asking around. No one could figure out who they were. Like, oh. <laughs> you know, you know, when you're in a social setting and, and everyone's like, hey, who's that dude or who's she? And then eventually that was happening last night and nobody knew. It was a couple, probably like mid 40s and, and you know, could have could have been or it's L.A. They're probably mid 50s and they look early 40s. You know, who knows what they were, but they, they dressed out like for rock, they're they're decked out for a rock night out. And they're sitting on the sofa. And they're making out like 14-year-olds at their first <laughs> spin the bottle party. And yeah. I mean, it's going on for a while. And then eventually yeah. the whole focus of the, there's several rooms backstage all in an area, but eventually everyone's just openly going like, hey, um, excuse us. Yeah, yeah. Um, hey, guys on the couch, little room. Can we get some space? They don't look up. They are literally in the, in the bubble we've all been in in eighth or ninth grade when you finally are at a party and everybody's okay to make out. <laughs> and and when I left, they 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 were still going as far as I knew, and it, it turned into such a thing. The conversation was 
Who are these people? They're probably both accountants, and this is their big night right. out. Because yeah. they're the guy's leather jacket looked a little too new and fresh yeah. and clean, and, right. and 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 she had she had like very very tight leather pants on, and everyone's going. This, I don't think that none of that looks like that's their daily look. <laughs> they are they are here for the rock night, and uh, yeah. it was just one of those like the the last thing you expect. You know, you think everyone's going to be super cool. They were they were going for it, and I just you made me think you use up like. They're probably both out on the scene. They're both going through a divorce, and now they're finally back out, and they're making up for lost time. Yeah, I mean, they got a little overstimulated. You get the ACDC tunes. Uh, nothing gets me hornier than those ACDC licks. Well, we closed the set with Night Prowler, so you yeah. know it's just going to... It's sultry, it's you know, yeah. cooking, it's bubbling up, subtle undertones. Yeah, yeah, that was obviously what, what led to that one. Oh, um, I, I wonder how they feel about it this morning. I mean, we've uh, we've all had kind of those weird moments. I remember doing that at a freaking uh, listener thing in the KQ suite. I forget who. I think it was like Iron Maiden or something. And I ended up uh, at one of those auction off the single DJ deals. Mm-hmm. And uh, so we just kind of met. And uh, before the show over there at uh, Ed Reed's, or I think we're at the Eagle Bar or whatever. Hey, how are you? Well, let's go enjoy this show. And I'm on my... And I get overserved, as happens sometimes, irresponsibly. And we ended up mashing for the whole Iron Maiden show. I never saw her again after that. <laughs> that was the, her KQ date, just mashing with the yeah. DJ with bad sure. breath. And the KQ suite. And I, I thought the next morning, I thought, what did I, what is wrong with me? I just get overstimulated. You know, the rock starts rolling and, uh, and things happen to you, but yeah, who knows? So yeah, they're big night out in the town, surrounded by stars. You got the ACDC music, a little Bill Burr comedy, and and they just lost it, you know? Next they thing just... you know, next thing you know, Jed's a millionaire. <laughs> next um, thing you know, old Jed's a millionaire. So uh, suffice to say, so Josh Fries, as I mentioned, was down uh, Foo Fighters' newest drummer. He's, you know, he's played with so many people. I mean, yeah. I mean, a, a, a ludicrous World, uh, world beating a resume since he was 17 on tour with Dweezil Zappa back in the late 80s. Uh, great guy. I've never met him. We, we have had, we've had mutual friends and we've just never crossed paths. We were just, you know, cutting up and, and, and getting to know each other all night. Suffice to say, we're totally hooked for the Foo Fighters next summer. We're just like, you know, he's like, oh, man, bring everybody. This is going to be great. So we, we got that going for us. Yeah. Thank, you're welcome, okay? I've yeah, completely made sure. <laughs> we'll, we'll all be on stage, you, okay? We're going we're gonna to do some backups with the Foos. They don't know that yet, but I'm just going to go ahead and say that. Um, that but but it was just a great it was just it was a great night uh, with the exception of the two people who decided it was their party <laughs> and and you know I mean these things happen we've all you know we're you're at the party and then one thing leads to another and suddenly the the police are called oh. or or go all the way back to when someone's parents were called I have been at a party. Uh, you know, I'm the eighth grader, but there's seniors there going back to the Shouse house, friends that we grew up with. They had the house and their parents were divorced. So the mom was out dating. So they were, that was where you could stay up late and go crazy because there was no adults. So I'm an eighth grader and I'm in a house with a ton of juniors and seniors in high school. And in the middle of just after the lights are dimming and there's people just making out in all different parts of the house, boom, door opens, not just mom, not just dad, but someone's both parents. And they are coming in there and I, I don't want to name names, Becky. And it's just like, Rebecca, you get out. And I mean, man, you talk about the immediate. First of all, there's like everyone's hands just go straight up in the air. Like, I'm not doing anything with these hands. And the whole party <laughs> shuts down. And, oh, yeah. we just, she, she didn't live it down forever. She's humiliated to no end. Oh, yeah. When parties sort of blow up. Now, weird things always happen. If it's a good party, weird things are going to happen. I know Candace stands with me on that. <laughs> Candace is probably the one that does the weird thing. But yeah. I went to a party in South Minnesota. In fact, I think it was in frickin' Richfield. And we're <laughs> at a bar, and this guy says, hey, listen, I uh, my girlfriend's a flight attendant, and all of her she's bringing all of her flight attendant friends over to my party, a little after party tonight. There's going to be a lot of single women there. Uh, you guys uh, should tag along. We're like, yeah, well, sure. That sounds like a great after party. We sounds like one of the great setups for a con in party history. First of all, he's not dating a flight attendant. And then he asked a flight attendant out for a date. I think they went out on one and then asked her to bring all of her friends. None of them show. Yeah. So here we are at the after party with all a bunch of dudes, which can still be a good time. But then someone goes, hey, the cops showed up. And this mm. guy grabs a golf club and just starts smashing all the light bulbs in the house. <laughs> 
I, yeah. We're like, hey, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa, dude, what's going on? So we, uh, you know, out the back door, across the yard, around the block, back to the car, and get the out of there. But uh, yeah, Candace so- always says there ain't no party like a Richfield party. Oh yeah, Richfield gets down. <laughs> Come on, Candace. How many times have you evaded police detection at a party uh, in Richfield? Uh, no comment. How many times haven't you? I'm a respectable citizen now yeah. at my old age. Oh man, that's that's good to hear. <laughs> she just put her up on blocks, folks. I think she's Candace. off the she's off the racetrack. I think it was Candace had an appearance once that gave me some of the best party advice ever when the cops show up and they bust a party. You never want to be the first one out the door. They're going to get the first one. And the last one, yeah, they're going to hang around and get the last one. Right there in the middle is when you want to make your break for it. And <laughs> that's some solid party advice right there. I would love some weird party stories. Hey, we're just coming off the holidays, New Year's Eve, amateur party night. There's got to be some weird Party, just strange stories from a party. Love to hear them this morning on the talk and text line. We've got an entertainment report. Mike Evans uh, finally got around to watching the national championship. <laughs> we'll get his uh, take here at 6 30. Hang tight. Connect with us on the KQ Talk and Text Line, 651 989 Rock. That's 651 989 Rock. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show for Wednesday, January the 10th. Tony is still under the weather. Uncle Tony not feeling well. Uh, Just the the sweetest guy in the world. Tony, get better, brother. We miss you. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, these things happen. End of the year, like you said, Zip, you get through the holidays, you start to spin out, and sometimes your body just goes, nah, I'm done. Yeah. I'm tapping (laughs) out. I need a break. Yeah. Uh, Get better, brother. Um... We were talking a minute ago on the show, if you're just joining us uh, here at the uh, crack of dawn on Wednesday, January the 10th, we were discussing uh, parties uh, and just just some of the weirdest things you've ever seen at a party. I just had a memory. Something about that door song just triggered a memory in my brain. Um, Are you familiar with the artist uh, named Peter Max? He's a psychedelic artist. He's done all kinds of stuff for, for, for decades uh, in the art scene, very colorful, psychedelic um, paintings. He'll take photographs and paint over them. And he's just done, done a lot of stuff. Very bright colors, uh, super uh, associated and heavily a part of the visual arts and culture of the 1960s. Uh, Bay Area, blah, blah, blah. Lived in New York for years. Anyway, fa- pretty famous guy. Yeah. In the mid 90s, uh, my former band, the Black Crows, were playing a show in New York and we are we get a message. Peter Max would love to have you guys over to his apartment for a party after a show. And nice. we're like, Peter Max? Really? Okay, cool. And we play our gig at the Beacon Theater, Upper West Side, and we go a few blocks away afterwards and we go into this incredible apartment. Like, The kind of place that nobody could possibly afford unless they have been renting it rent controlled since the 70s. Like it was, you know, it wasn't the Dakota, but it kind of felt like that when you got in the building. We were like, who in the world could possibly afford a place like this? And we're like the guests of honor. And he had a photo. So he, he found a band photo and he had painted six of them. Uh, he'd blown them up and done his thing to them and then presented them to each member of the band. Here's an original Peter Max. Uh, I'll just cut to the chase. I have no idea where mine is. I just, <laughs> somewhere in a bin, what? I'm now realizing, oh man, that thing's worth some coin right now. Yeah. But we're at this party and and it was the the craziest mix of folks you've ever seen at a party. And we still never, no idea who put our band on his radar, but we're like, yeah, sure. And um, so the the weirdest part of the party, however, was the fact that we were there and we were all on shrooms and we're (laughs) and it's like New York art, you know, intelligentsia art world. And people are drinking weird liqueurs you've never heard of and just admiring and very quiet conversations. And we come in and within a few minutes, we're all just doing that thing where we're laughing at everything because the absurdity is apparent to us like that. This is the craziest thing ever. And the fact that we're here and we're all tripping balls makes it that much crazier. And, um, and then, and we were friends with those guys and the kids in the hall and a couple of them show up. (laughs) And so then we're all, and then they're with us on the, on the sphere. 
And we're all just having like this private, completely insane thing. My point is this. I know for a fact that we are the people that those people talked about for weeks after that party. (laughs) Because, you know, we're like all wearing overalls and everyone's got beards. We just looked, we looked like we had fallen off a psychedelic turnip truck from 30 years earlier anyway. And, uh, man, I I just now, all that just to say... We're talking about crazy things you've seen at parties, and I just realized, no, wait, that was actually, yeah, we were the crazy. We were the <laughs> we were the zoo animals one night on the Upper West Side uh, at, at a Peter Max party, and now, by God, I got to find that thing. Yeah, no kidding. I just Googled <laughs> the guy because I'm like, oh, yeah, he sounds familiar, and then, boom, it pops up, and it's all over the place. By the way, his popularity grew when he created the advertising campaign for Uncola for 7-Up in 1968. <laughs> Uh, and wow! Then just, and then he just he just charged in with uh, some fantastic looking art, but you know it uh, when you see it. I would say yeah. to the listener, I mean, oh no wonder we about? were drinking Seven Up all night. I never knew. <laughs> I never so, understood why. It's what goes with shrooms, you know. That's exactly yeah. what it is. A good shroom burp there, but yeah, I'm looking at some of his Black Crow stuff. You should find it. Peter I'm, Mac stuff is highly collectible. Yeah, I really need valuable. to. It's, you need to uh, dig around in the attic. <laughs> Uh, that's uh, yeah, I got to <laughs> rethink that one. Right. Uh, hey, listen, right now on the KQ 92 talk and text line, if you text the word Joey, J O E Y six, five, one, nine, eight, nine rock, you will have a chance to win tickets to bad finger featuring Joey Molland. That's Saturday at the St. Croix casino, Danbury prize provided by the St. Croix casino. Nothing wrong with a night of bad finger music. Oh, hell no. No, he's kind of, he, he's done some KQ gigs before. Uh, mm-hmm. Sounds fantastic. You know all the words. And yeah, it's yep. uh, Badfinger. That's all you have to say. Joey. One of one of the great should woulda, coulda, shoulda bands, for sure. Yeah. Uh, Badfinger. I mean, they, they did the part where they made the great music. Uh, what they didn't have was the long, sustained career. Badfinger's as good as it gets. Let's, um, hey, I'm still in L.A., so let's get on the Hollywood uh, report from Mike Evans. What do you say? Hey, good morning, Steve and Candace and Zeb. Hey, good morning, everybody. What a great game. Michigan beating Washington on Monday night. Had a lot of fun. Oh, and starting tomorrow, we'll talk a little bit about the NFL playoffs. This report brought to you by our good friends at Marcus Theaters. You know, the reclining seats at Marcus Theaters, uh, the only bad thing about them is it's easy to fall asleep. I mean, they're that comfortable. Go to Marcus Theaters on Friday. We'll have some movie reviews and a lot more. Okay, so... We're going way, way, way out there today, guys. There have been rumors of UFOs and outer space visitors for years, but with the secret closed-door investigations in Congress, more and more people believe there are visitors here on Earth from other planets. And now you can judge for yourself. Check it out. Tonight on Tubi Television, the second part of UFO Revolutions. Mm. Uh, it's produced by TMZ, actually. It is fabulous. Now, I don't know really what to tell you, but this three-night special will make you think. It might scare you, but guarantee it will get your attention. Congressmen like Tim Burchett, top reporters from the New York Times, military experts, aerospace executives, and others all seem to agree, some of them, they say there's definitely, we are not alone, there are aliens among us. They say this is the biggest cover-up in American history. Tubi Television called UFO Revolutions Tonight. Check it out. Hmm. You know what? More and more celebrities are pulling out of social media. Mila Kunis, Sandra Bullock, Brad Pitt, Scarlett Johansson, Kristen Stewart, and more are pulling out every week. And maybe somehow this is connected, but you're hearing it here first. Several presidential candidates have asked several celebrities to spend the summer campaigning for them. Now, I'm talking about Republicans and Democrats both. And so far, very, very few, if any, have agreed. Hollywood is keeping away from the election this time around. Probably just as good. So tomorrow we'll talk a little bit about the NFL playoffs. And I have a profile tomorrow and some funny, funny stories about a celebrity a celebrity that everybody likes. Everybody likes this guy. And is getting a Lifetime Achievement Award from the critics at the Critics Award Show this weekend. Great stories about a great guy tomorrow. Okay, we'll try to stay warm. Boy, the weather up there in Minneapolis-St. Paul. Whew. Stay warm. 
Be happy. Talk to you tomorrow. Mike Evans, see ya. Right on. <laughs> you heard him. Stay warm. Yeah. <laughs> Mike, some, some celebrities getting an award. I'm going to go with Jim Neighbors. Is he still with us? No, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't think he is. Damn. I think we he lost said, uh, when I, I, by the way, this is where my brain is. Mike Evans just said, uh, you've got aerospace execs talking about his alien documentary. Aerospace execs. And in my brain, I went, Aerosmith execs. Who the hell's talking to them about it? <laughs> oh, he said aerospace, not Aerosmith. Yeah. My bad. Yeah, eh, what are you going to do? <laughs> that is a fine line. Hey, um, I don't know if you have any um, interest or experience or thoughts on IRS auctions, but in Bloomington right now, the IRS seized an Aston Martin uh, mm. recently, and they are putting it up for auction. It's a two-door coupe, Aston Martin DB11. The estimated retail value is $277,000. But right now, the current top bid on this is $170,000. So uh, right now, if that if that bid goes through, somebody's going to save a hundred large on this bad boy. Um, a 2023 Aston Martin DB11 just taken from the IRS. That's that's a pain that's going to linger. That's a sting when yeah. you go when you slap leather for the for the Aston Martin and within it's a 2023. So within a year the IRS goes, "Oh, yeah, we're taking that by the way. Thank you." Maybe ouch. Maybe pay your taxes instead of going car shopping for James Bond's Wheels. Yeah, I think that's what he drove, wasn't it? I don't that know was, that's it. exactly what he drove. Paying taxes, kind of, kind of, it's helpful in terms of you know if you have a plan for your year. Yeah, take make sure the IRS doesn't come knocking on the door. I've yeah. never, I've never gone to one of these auctions. You see things all the time. I, I, one of these days, I'm gonna have to get around to it because obviously I'm not, I'm not in the market for an Aston Martin. But I bet there's like a cool old Gremlin or something you could find. <laughs> Someone's got a a rejuvenated AMC Gremlin for. Nine Nine grand. That'd be worth taking a look at. Someone didn't pay their taxes, so they took their gremlin. Boy, that would just Oof. be a great insult, wouldn't it? My dad was not on the IRS ones. We didn't have those in South Dakota. But in South Dakota, they had, I don't know how the drug laws are now, but when I was growing up, uh, they were pretty harsh. And any little, they caught you with a roach in your car, they would seize your vehicle. So they had police auctions. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Police yeah, auctions. Dad, oh, my dad loved the police auctions. That's where we got our bicycles, and Chris got his first car. He'd go there, and yeah, he'd get like a $5,000 car for 10 bucks and yeah he would go there and whip it up at the police auctions and it would stagger me in a small town now this is in huron not wolsey south dakota where i grew up Thirteen thousand people it's a big metro there but a staggering amount of seizures uh, by the police each year so are these irs auctions yeah you got to be able to get some big items for some low dough because they yeah they got to go they're not gonna you know they just want to get rid of them so you know, it's going to go to the highest bidder. Not bad. Yeah, the police auction, I forgot about that. I had a uh, a, a, a five-speed Schwinn bicycle, the banana seat with the big oh, gear nice. shifter thing in the middle, you know, and the yeah. and the high handlebars, blue sparkle. It was badass. And uh, <laughs> it was stolen out of our carport, and I we reported it to the police, and their answer was, well, if it turns up, you know, when we, if, you know, we just auction off like found property like that. And I'm like, I'm in a small town. And I'm, I remember saying like, wait, there's there's not a lot of these bikes. You can't just write a note that if this turns up, call the Gormans. And the guy looked at me like, kid, don't you understand? We've got, you know, we someone stole a six pack of Coke from a convenience store. That's more important. Who knows what the hell they were talking about? But I, I and and so we went to a police auction and uh, and and never saw the bike, never saw the bike. And then like a year later, I literally saw a kid riding that bike and went right up to him. And he said, yeah, my dad got it at the police auction. And I was like, I mean, I know it was my bike. I was like, that's that's my bike. And he was like, yeah. not anymore. It's not. Yeah. And I was devastated. And by the way, only kind of devastated compared to when five, six years later, my brother Doug copped to the fact that he had been out that night on my bike getting into trouble and the police showed up and he ditched it and oh. ran on foot. Wow. 
reveal. Yeah, like we oh. were in college when he, oh, by the way, you know that bike? Yeah, sorry, that was me. <laughs> I, and I was immediately as angry as when I walked out that morning and saw that it was not in the carport. I mean, yeah. I wanted to fight him. And he's like, it's like six years ago. I'm like, yeah, and I'm still <laughs> pissed. It was unreal. That man is now an elected public servant, by the way. <laughs> well, that that checks out. Um, it certainly yeah, does. time had passed. He probably thought he had, yeah, hey, you're, you're going to laugh at this. It's interesting. Oh, when no. You say, when you think, yeah, yeah, not enough time has passed. Yeah, Absolutely well. just killed me. Uh, time time <laughs> is passing every minute, so let's look back while we can. Here's a history lesson for Wednesday, January the 10th. Sports history. On this day in 1982, you can keep your ice bowl, baby. Don't give me that Lambeau Field nonsense. The Freezer Bowl went down in Cincinnati. The Bengals hosted oh. the Chargers in the AFC Championship game. 35 degrees below zero. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was negative nine, 35 mile per hour winds. The wind chill was 59 below at kickoff. 59 below. And the Bengals were playing the Chargers, as I just mentioned. The Chargers, a week earlier, had played one of the all-time great playoff games in Miami. The difference from Sunday to Sunday for the Chargers, 143 degrees. Wow. That was the temperature adjustment. <laughs> they, unsurprisingly, got their asses kicked 27 to 7. Uh, the Bengals players came out without sleeves. They shirtless, <laughs> uh, sleeveless jerseys. And, it, and and after the game, the Chargers didn't even try to act tough. They were like, no, we they weren't wearing, a, they didn't have line anything layered or no linings. We knew we were done. It was toast. 59 below. That's completely insane. It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. Zip, Tony, Candace, and Steve Gorman are the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show for Wednesday, January the 10th. Billy Idol with Rebel Yell, a song he was inspired to write. When he saw Keith Richards at an event in London and Keith was holding a bottle of Rebel Yell bourbon and Billy Idol didn't even know what that was, but he was like, Rebel Yell, I like the sound of that. That's a song <laughs> title right there, isn't it? And he was on to something. We have been talking today about insane things we've seen or done at parties, just bizarre party stories. And Billy Idol, his name is on the short list of all time greatest, most bizarre party thing ever. Billy Idol in 1989 was going through a, a breakup with the mother of his kid. He was feeling very depressed. He couldn't stop, uh, what do you call it, sleeping with every woman he met. He was out of his absolute mind, and he decided to get away with a trip to Bangkok to clear his head. Um, he's the first person on earth who thought going to Thailand with two buddies would be a good idea to clear his head uh, to get his life back together. And he checked into a hotel, and these are quotes, by the way. We were just going to drink and not take any drugs. After about a week, drinking all the time was getting heavy, so we asked a cab driver if he could find us some Coke. We, he went off and came back with a thin vial. It was six or seven inches long, and we thought, what do you think it is? This isn't what Coke usually comes in. Next thing you know, we're all doing heroin, and it was really strong. The story goes on. Two weeks, he and his friends are raging at a party. And because the heroin's so strong, then they have to go out back and actually find proper cocaine to stay awake. And then they get Valiums, and then they keep drinking. And it goes on. He's at a very nice hotel in Thailand. And the staff keeps coming up and going, hey, there's complaints about the noise. And he doesn't want to hear it. And they don't want to be rude to Billy Idol. They are entering the third week of this binge. Literally, the third week. He finally starts to snap. He's got a big hotel suite. By this time, it's filled with all of his brand new best friends. Uh, you know, drugs yeah. always bring new friends, don't they? Oh, um, yeah. He started smashing things like, you know, mirrors, televisions, windows. He was going out of his mind. The army was called. <laughs> That's, I didn't say the police. I said the army. <laughs> they came in and somebody shot him with a tranquilizer gun. Yes. 
That's how the party ended. He was taken out on a stretcher. Billy Idol, or as I call him, William Idol, earned his keep that week, that month, I should say, in Thailand. That's pretty good. I've never seen anyone brought down with a tranquilizer dart at a party, but man, I would really love to see it. Oh man, that's that's how you wrap up the '80s, right there. I wonder. I mean, what's the? Uh, I mean, do you get home and go, "Hi, hey, you know, I'm just gonna go with, uh, yeah, I'm just gonna go with a healthy diet. Just drink some smoothies, uh, <laughs> take January off, so sure. what do they call it uh, sober month or whatever, and dry uh, month." I yeah, when you start mixing the drugs with the alcohol, that triggered this one on the KQRS Facebook post. Andrea, back in the day, a classmate that happened to be the daughter of the police chief, drank while taking flagell. I did have to Google that. I didn't know what flagell was. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right. Never heard of it. It's a drug used to treat bacterial vaginosis, uh, and you don't drink with it. Big no-no, Andrea writes. It makes one violently vomit for the majority, but she happened to (laughs) also shat her pants at a house party. Uh, frigid January, this time of the year, our friends uh, helped her find another pair of pants through the other ones in the alley. So when you find the crappy pair of pants in the alley, this is what's happening. Uh, they came back the next day to find them, but they were gone. <laughs> uh, the police chief was oh not God. happy, blamed no. a mutual friend for his daughter getting drunk. Well, it wasn't his little princess's fault. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that's pretty nutty right there. I um, I, I, the only thing I would say to her, I'm, I have to go right to stripes and say, I want to party with you, cowgirl. That's <laughs> that is impressive. Uh, you know, it's it's either the it's it's the chief of police's daughter or it's the preacher's daughter. That if either one of those two girls shows up, the party's just getting started. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, if you have a nutty, crazy party story of any flavor, we'd love to hear it this morning on the talk and text line 989 Rock, 651 989 Rock. I remember in college going out there in South Dakota, uh, going to an I Hate Winter party. It was this time of January, and it's it, this theme sounds like a lot of fun, doesn't it? I Hate Winter Party. And yeah. what you do is you wear your swimsuit over there. Uh, whatever you've got, that's all you wear. And then, you you know, you find a lay somewhere, I don't know, went to a party store, uh, your Hawaiian shirts, that sort of thing. And it's I Hate Winter, and we're going to get all festive. That's the theme. However, the guy that threw the party at his parents' house there in Aberdeen, South Dakota, invited hundreds of people over that showed up for this I Hate Winter party, scantily clad in January in South Dakota, said, "What well, you can't come inside. It's an I Hate Winter party. We have to do it outside. Mom and Dad would, absolutely, I cannot let you weirdos in the house. And it was, you know, like five degrees out that night, below <laughs> zero wind chills, and we're all out there drinking alcohol, half-dressed. I do remember one guy on the football team lost two toes to frostbite. And oh, my God. God. Yeah, after about the because we didn't know any better after the fifth or sixth uh, collegiate co-ed had ended up in the hospital, they finally sent over the cops to find out what's going on. And I hate winter parties were banned in Aberdeen, South Dakota, uh, for quite a long time. But that was a pretty weird one. Yeah, Everybody that's pretty just strong. To go inside. He had everything locked down. He's like, no one can go inside. You know, or out there. And our, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, that's like news. the uh, when, when I was in school at Western Kentucky, there was a bar that used to have like the well, every night was a different theme night, but they had bladder bust night and it was free draft beer in the bar until someone has to use the bathroom. <laughs> so just picture the scene. You got a bar, you fill it with 200 college kids and free draft beer. And as long as no one goes into the bathroom to pee, oh, the yeah. beer continues to flow. It's called the bladder bust. Yeah. Well, it's always a girl who breaks first, and you've got a, you got a guy at each Bloody station bladder. at each door. And every time someone starts walking that way, then you've got a hundred dudes going no, no, <laughs> and gen- and usually you would find a, a poor. It was almost always a girl. There was one time I know for a fact it was a guy. It was my buddy John who's like, I can't help it, man. I gotta go. And and people pick you up. They carry you away from the bed. Ba- you end up pissing yourself because they will not let you go into the bathroom to pee because the draft beer needs to continue to roll. Uh, yeah, boy, that's uh, you know th- that would never go down these days. The 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 eighties were, you know, and of course in the eighties, my friend, the, the older friends are going, man, the seventies were when it was all really happening, yeah. you know, as it goes. But yeah, I don't see a lot of bladder busts. My both my kids are in college. <laughs> I tell them stories like that, and they look at me like I am from Mars. They're like, right. wait, what? Free draft <laughs> beer till someone pees? Like that is that's cruelty. And I'm like, no, that's called living. L I V I N. Candace, do we have a caller? Adam from Glencoe. 
Good morning, Adam, brother. How are you? Good, good morning. I'm doing wonderful. Great. What do you got um, for us, brother? Back in the middle 80s, I bought a brand new cattle trailer that I pulled behind my goose deck. And so then I stopped at the liquor store uptown and they decided, well, let's go for a ride. And they said, we loaded 40 people in the trailer. We did this like every <laughs> Halloween two years after that. Yeah. <laughs> We'd have kegs in the back and go bar hopping. The worst one I remember. I, I like taking a keg to bar. I like showing yeah. up to a bar with a keg. That's strong. Yeah, and a cattle you, you trailer. Get from, you know, it's like 10 miles to the next bar, so you can't wait, you know, <laughs> can't wait 10 minutes to have another beer. So we, sure. we went, but we finished two kegs in the trailer and we went to Buck's Bar in Hamburg. Remember Buck Zoom off, the old all star wrestler? Yeah. When he retired from that, he had a a bar out there and he had a barber chair he'd lay you back and pour shots in your mouth <laughs> 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 on the trailer yeah. out of 43 people me and the gal that was pregnant were sober there was probably five six people that were good and drunk but there was 35 people so hammered they couldn't walk yeah <laughs> i mean you, you, when you ever go to a party and someone is so drunk they're just obnoxious there was 35 people like that <laughs> that's pretty strong my man that's that's good oh, stuff yeah, you it's always it's done. always there's always one guy and there's always one pregnant girl and they just they tell that story forever and everyone else goes yeah if you say so. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome, Adam. That's, thank you for the call, man. You That's, how, Have a good That's day. how you do it out in the country, right? You get them in the cattle trailer with the kegs. You know, you improvise. <laughs> uh, we've been talking about the '80s. Uh, Wade <laughs> representing the '90s here. He says in the early '90s on the KQ Facebook page, we had house parties every weekend, and we would pick up the new guy or gal at the party with a few of us and hold them up to and against the ceiling for a minute or two. <laughs> <What>? <laughs> Only dropped one what? guy, as far as I can remember. I don't know. It's just if you're the new person, you're getting pinned to the ceiling. That's that's weird. That's crazy. I I, I, I'm digging that. I like yeah. that. Uh, Zep, <laughs> Zep, I see Danny writes, I remember some Zep stories. He's a bad man. Oh, no. Come on. That was uh, that was back in the, uh, that was the start of my radio career back in the Sioux City, Iowa. Denny Anderson, uh, who is one of the original wild men. Uh, yeah, he was my program director down there in Sioux City. And that was early 20s, man. So you know how I was. You know what I was up to back then? It was just, uh, it was chaos. It was debauchery. And yeah, I do remember after a ZZ Top gig that I do not remember go even going to, uh, laying in the parking lot and looking up and just Denny, big like six foot six Denny looking down at me and me going, Denny, you can't leave me. Denny was... <laughs> Denny was probably there for the Lita Ford show as well. In fact, I'm sure he was. So, yeah, it was uh, 20s, you know, radio. It was uh, it was not sure. It was the 80s. That's that's what we were doing, getting away with it. And Denny, you are a big bad man. <laughs> uh, right here's back at you. here's one I'm reading. When I was in high school, I was at a party. Many of us were making out in a darkened basement, and we've all been there. Yeah. Our young love was interrupted by the sound of vomit. The light went on. We discovered a guy had puked all over this poor girl. The dude never lived it down, and when his family moved a few months later, many believed this was the reason. <laughs> the whole family moved. That's I, I. But but isn't that classic fourteen, fifteen year old thinking? Like oh, this yeah. guy vomits, and three months later, the family moves, and you immediately. No, his dad didn't get a new job. No, it's because of the puke. They had to leave town. They couldn't live it down. I've um, in Atlanta, when I first moved down there to start the band and put the band together, a bunch of us lived in one, in a house in a neighborhood called Candler Park. And it was there was four guys that paid rent and at least four more that crashed every night. It was a fantastic band flap house. Two bands operating out of this one house. And we had a blowout party going on. And one of my roommates, let's just call him Chris, he was uh, with a girl, and they were in the bathroom because that was the only place they could find where they could shut a door. And they're in there making out. And literally, I just heard a, w a girl scream, and I just thought, what in the world? And she walked out, and she was covered in red wine puke. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just looking at me like, sorry, man. I'm like, don't apologize to me. I don't care. Hello. And she rushes out of the party. That did. <laughs> now, now, no one had to leave town, but but the party did shut down. That was like the beginning of the end of the night. And in the morning, I wake up and I can still, it still smells terrible in the house. And I go over and I wake, I'm like, dude, wake up and clean that damn bathroom. And he's like, okay, sorry. I walk outside to get away from the smell. 
five minutes later, I walk back in, and another roommate named James, a more gullible sort, is in there cleaning up all the puke. Oh, James. And I go, James, what are you doing? He goes, oh, I don't even remember throwing up last night. <laughs> and I went over there, and Chris was already asleep again. I woke him up again. I go, no, you are not pinning this off on somebody else. I refuse. You have to get in there. And so he goes in there. I make him go clean it up. And what does he do? Immediately hurls again. <laughs> Yeah, I was like, yeah, that that shut down. That part, that that house was shut down for a couple of days after that one. We had to bring in a team from the EPA to get a clearance to bring more oh, people over. That stains that red wine stains. Candace, mm. I want to bring Candace in on this one. Another quick one before we drive on here. Uh, Buddy talked me into going uh, to a stopping by a party. That is for a few minutes. We walk in and everybody is naked in a pile on the floor, like 30 people. <laughs> he says, uh, no. Candace, do you go in or do you just retreat? I'd go in. Why not? <laughs> I know you would. Life, hey, man. You gotta keep life interesting. Yeah. Gotta keep life interesting. And, you know, what is life if not to be lived? And new yeah. experiences... <laughs> 31 strangers all getting to know each other in a certain way sure now and, and i appreciate your uh your 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 authenticity here candace i can tell you straight up not me i'm turning right around and walking out yeah gets a little weird too much touching all right we want to hear your crazy party stories this morning love to hear them on the talk and text line 651-989-ROCK if you're feeling a little bashful a little rushed you can jump on the kq facebook page also i see career builders Dot com, the website, uh, posted some of their uh, craziest things that have happened at job interviews in the past year. That's always a pretty good read. We've got that coming for you this morning as well. Hang tight. Connect with us on the KQ Talk and Text Line, 651-989-ROCK. That's 651-989-ROCK. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show for Wednesday, January 10th. At 9 o'clock this morning, Robert Smith is going to be calling in to uh, break down the Viking season that was, look ahead to the playoffs. We'll, we'll we'll just name him GM for the day and let get his thoughts on what the Vikings need to do in what order of priority are their off-season uh, duties. According to the great icon himself, Robert Smith, that is at 9 a.m. We've been talking about bizarre crazy, hilarious party stories. So far, uh, the guy with the horse trailer bringing a keg to a bar crawl. That's my favorite. I, I, the idea of loading 35 of your friends into the back of a trailer and doing a bar crawl where you have kegs on hand for, for those moments in between bars. Yeah. That's about as good as it gets. But that, I'm not saying you can't top it, but I'm you're more than welcome to try. Give us a call on the KQ uh, Talk and Text Line, 651-989-ROCK. Candace, do we have a caller right now? Yes, Carolyn from Chaska. Carolyn, good morning. Good morning. How are you guys? We're doing great. Thank you. What have you got for us today, sister? Well, I grew up west of Aberdeen, South Dakota, went to SDSU in Brookings, and my roommate's boyfriend and several friends lived in this dilapidated house in Brookings. They rented it. Sure. And they decided to have a Chislick party one night. Do you know what Chislick is? I do. I'm a South Dakota kid. I don't know. Yeah, it's it's like um, you take pieces of, of meat, beef, and you deep fry them. So they had a bunch of kettles of, of oil sitting around to deep fry this public <laughs> in. Oh boy. Uh -huh. And um, of course, uh, the beer was flowing better than everything else and they tipped one of the kettles over in the kitchen and this dilapidated house with the with the floors that weren't even, we'd be talking and all of a sudden all of us would just kind of slide into the wall until we got there and then we come back up <laughs> on the floor and my friend's roommates or my roommate's boyfriend said I'll fix it. He went out and got two shovels of dirt and threw them on the kitchen floor to try to eliminate the slippery floor. <laughs> so, And um, having grown up West Aberdeen um, you should know too that there used to be a bar, I think it was No Dogs Allowed and they would have a drink or tea night and uh, you can have free beer until you had to go to the bathroom. Somebody went to the bathroom. Yeah, so sure. There you it's go. been around a while. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Man, I, I got to get to West Aberdeen. I'm missing out. You are, or at least Brookings. 
<laughs> All right, fair enough. Brookings. All right, Zep, you can show me where that is on the map. Thanks for the call. That's great. Absolutely. Aberdeen, that's Northern. That's uh, Northern State University. That's where I went to school. A little smaller than South Dakota State University. National football champs in Division Two. I still call it Division Two, not FCS. I sure. like this one from uh, Steve. Uh, we saw a man vomit at a party right in the middle of the floor. That's not it. In the vomit, an intact, perfectly shaped Dorito chip. <laughs> We were all so blown away, we stood around uh, studying this chip, trying to decide how could he not only swallow an intact Dorito chip, but then throw it back up. It just brought the party to a halt. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would imagine so. I've how? never had, I've never been having enough fun to not stop what I was doing to sit there and stare at a full Dorito chip if I'd seen that happen. <laughs> no kidding. I mean, it would just, still, it's bothering me now. It's going to be in my mind all day long. How? If I were in the middle of a gig, I'd stop playing and go, what, how did this happen? <laughs> Wait a minute. Hold on. Let, house lights up. Let's take a look at this. We got to figure this out. I, I just had a memory of uh, when I when, when I was in school, there was a, a, a dilapidated rental house, the rugby house, and um, uh, it, because that's where the rugby players lived. Uh, if you were playing rugby in college in the 80s, what you were was a frustrated football player. Couldn't make the football team, and someone said, here, try this game. It's even potentially more violent, and you don't have to wear a helmet. And so those were the guys that would have – I had a band in college. Uh, it was just covers – uh, and, you know, revolving door of people, whoever had an amp that worked that week, uh, we would just play, you know, the same 40 songs three times a night. And we changed our name every time we played, which is not a good way to build a following. Um, I, I, we, you know, we market, we were no, no marketing majors in the band at that time, but we were at the rugby house rocking and a rolling one night and. The rugby guys all decided to just, in the middle of the party, suddenly they were all doing an elephant walk through the middle of the house, <laughs> which is, you know, pantless. Yeah. Uh, you know how elephants <laughs> link trunks and tails? Yeah. Oh, man. About nine sweaty, no. drunk no. rugby players elephant walking <laughs> through their own party. And it's their house, so you can't do yeah. anything. And they do want to fight, so you just let it go. <laughs> We just kept playing. Everybody kept kind of rocking out and trying not to get in the middle of two of the elephants, if you will. You didn't want body parts rubbing up against no. you. Yeah, it's good stuff. Ah, they're big. Yeah, they, they want someone to make a move. Um, here's one, Kathy, on the KQ Facebook page. Uh, I'm sorry, do, I can wait a minute. Do we have another caller? Yeah, John from St. Paul. John, good morning, brother. Good morning, brother. Uh, what do you got? What do you got for just, us? <laughs> My senior grade, my high school graduation party at my parents' house. <laughs> my dad was never <laughs> one to shy away from not letting us drink beer. If we did it regularly or if we were allowed to do it at home, we wouldn't go out, you know, and do stupid stuff. Yeah. So my grad, my graduation party, my father decided, that's fine. Have your friends over. When they come in the door, drop their keys in the bowl. They can't leave. They can't go anywhere, but they can drink. And I, so we that, start drinking, and a couple of our powerhouse friends who were powerhouse drinkers showed up about halfway through it, finished off the keg that was left. Well, they had brought beer. And when my father figured out that they polished off all the beer, he took their beer <laughs> and said, this is not mine. And when they figured that out, they got all mad and came down to the fire and, you know, I can talk crap about my family, but nobody else has done it. Of course. And, yeah. and they start talking crap about my father, and all of a sudden I look over, and here's my brother. He's going over the fire pit <laughs> at the guy. Next thing you know, we got 20, 20 high school graduates fighting in the backyard, fist fighting, throwing fists. Next thing I know, my dad's behind me. He's throwing fists. Luckily, one of his friends was sober enough and mature enough to start breaking stuff up. Um, but, yeah, to this day, every time I get together with friends, they're like, hey, do you remember that? It ended up being 
we're lucky the cops didn't show up and drag everybody to jail. <laughs> I, I, I just love, or you know, this is hours after some blowhard gave a commencement speech about the first day of the rest of your life. <laughs> Six right? hours later, you guys are throwing hands at a backyard hook. That's yeah. fantastic. And isn't it always the case there's a fire pit in between you and the guy you want to punch? Isn't that how oh, it always yeah. works out? Oh, and I'll never forget it because I looked up and my brother, one leap, he was over that fire. And this is not a small, this is a deep-sized fire pit. He's over that fire pit and throwing hands at the guy. His buddy jumped in. <laughs> so then I jumped in. And I've got four brothers. So all four of us at one point, we're all in it. Our other friends are getting involved. I mean, there was probably 25 people fighting, just yeah. fighting in the backyard. And this isn't just a slap you around. We're, we're all yeah. out now because now you were talking crap about my dad. So yeah. now we're all out. We're not <laughs> friends for right now. Yeah. They that is outstanding. The and they diss dad. I love it. You don't even have time to run around the fire pit like a demon coming through no, the flames. I like the bit. Yeah. That, <laughs> oh boy. Oh, but okay. I. None of my friends forget it to this day. Everybody always is bringing it up when we get together with any of them that were there. And they're like, and actually, I had a girlfriend that left the party halfway through it. She's like, because you guys are nuts, man. The cops are going to end up here. And I'm going to end up having to explain to my mom why my boyfriend's father threw a kegger for his high school graduate kid. And yeah. now I'm in jail. And she was like, oh. It's a uh, time. <laughs> it's just poetry, man. You're painting a beautiful picture for us, brother. Thank you for the call. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Ben. Uh, uh, from, uh, right? From John. I, I learned a long time ago, um, as a parent, you cannot get involved with the, the kids' parties. You're either there to chaperone or yeah. get the hell out of there. Go have a party right. with your friends somewhere else. Uh, Kathy on the KQ Facebook page. We camped on the side of a river with red clay on the riverbed drinking mescal and eating magic mushrooms mm. buck naked mm. we made little clay people then made ourselves into clayleans by putting clumps of it all <laughs> over our bodies yes. that's when that's when a guy pulls up with his wife and two kids to camp they didn't stay long <laughs> no they did not I, I bet dad wanted to double back though <laughs> let me get you guys into a hotel i'm gonna go back and check on those <laughs> we just make sure that everything's okay made themselves into clayleans thank you kathy for introducing me to a new term this i morning. like clayleans i like clayleans and uh and candace you had the laugh of recognition on that i i will oh, say clayleans yes uh, yeah. classic you, you, you and your you and those red clay knights down in Richfield. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, listen, who am I to stop the party? Oh, do we have uh, something to, to pitch in here before we drive on? I would just like to remind everybody that, you know, we can all do this together. We can stream 92 KQRS on our phones. Listen anywhere you go. You can, uh, you know, you can search 92 KQRS at the app store and then you just, then wherever you go, you got us in your pocket. Or simply, if you got a smart speaker, why don't you just say this? Ahem. Play 92 KQRS. It's just that simple, guys. I tell you what, when I was on uh, the big break there, I was rocking the KQ app. And then when you set it to your app, you, you know, you hook it up Bluetooth in the old vehicle there. Every time I jumped in and just fired up the truck, straight Boom. to the KQ app. I like it. And sound the processing on it is pretty damn good. Uh, well, we're not one to stop the party, especially when it's crazy. Uh, you got a crazy party story, pitch it in. The talk and text line is 651-989-ROCK. We have something up on the KQ Facebook page. And we might just get around to this careerbuilders.com. Uh, the weirdest things that have happened in job interviews in the past year. Hang tight. It's the KQ Morning Show, 92 KQRS. Zip, Tony. Candace and Steve Gorman are the KQ Morning Show, 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show, Wednesday, January the 10th, one hour from right now. Robert Smith will be on this very show. We will talk about the Viking season. Well, well there's not much to say about what we just witnessed uh, this past season. We've been discussing it week to week with Robert. But we'll, we'll look at where they go from here. We'll look at the upcoming playoffs. Our final segment of the year with the great Vicon himself. That is one hour from right now. We have been discussing parties. And uh, last night, I was uh, a part of a pretty darn good one. That song we just heard, ACDC's Highway to Hell, 
uh, I I was not playing it last night, but I was watching it being played uh, at a gig. It was a tribute to Bon Scott in Los Angeles that I took part in last night. I played on a bunch of great... What did I play? I played Livewire, a whole lot of Rosie, Riff Raff, uh, Bad Boy, Boogie, Night yeah. Prowler. I had some good ones. Yeah. Uh, but Highway to Hell... Uh, unfortunately for me, I didn't get to play that one. Uh, Josh Freeze from the Foo Fighters was drumming on that particular one. But I loved uh, the songs that I didn't play on are actually almost more fun because it walk off the stage and then from the side, watch everybody else on stage just those three guys on that stage all trying to be Malcolm Young and then one guy <laughs> trying to be Angus Young. And these are all world-class musicians. Josh Freeze, tremendous drummer. He's trying to be Phil Rudd as, as best as he can, yeah. just like I am. And watching all these guys now, everybody's, you know, I'm 58. Everyone's around there from 50 to 60, maybe early 60s. And we're all living out our high school fantasy of just being in ACDC all on stage last night. And it was an absolute blast. And and we were talking about the genius that is ACDC. You, you will talk to musicians and they go, it's all so simple. It's just three chords. It's just this. The dr There's no drum fills. It's all straight. And all that's true. But what I've said for years is, uh, well, then you do it. Go ahead. Get a bunch of great musicians and try to uh, replicate what ACDC does. It is the greatest game of chess that looks like checkers in rock history. That music is so difficult to get right. You can get close to right. And you can sound like ACDC, but you can't feel like ACDC. There's just something in the chemistry of those players, and especially in the Bon Scott era, that is just absolutely impossible to, to, to get it exactly right. But man, is it fun trying. And, uh, and, and we had a blast last night. Uh, I think that's the fourth time we've done this over the years, but the first one in four years, because uh, the, the last time we all got together and did this was the week that like COVID exploded all over March of 2020. And in fact, that night we were playing the gig and everybody was saying like, this is probably the last thing we're going to do for a while, isn't it? Because, you know, with every hour, there was more updates about the world going into, uh, you know, lockdown mode. And so after four years, it was really great to get back up there and do it again. And it was a, a really nice night, a great night of rock, and then a great after show. Uh, just, just I, I basically am pulling an all-nighter here, but now I'm talking about it again and hearing Highway to Hell. I'm, I'm fired up all over again to talk about insane party stories. And this is a great one. On the Facebook page, we asked, you know, what's your crazy party story? Um, I, this is a, a great one. Kelly wrote, in the 80s, we brought a keg onto the Stone Arch Bridge before it was a tourist attraction, and we partied there. While sitting on the edge, sipping our beers, my friend Shelly G was laughing so hard, she fell off the bridge into the Mississippi. Oh, oh my gosh. All I heard was, oh. Kelly, and then splash. Oh, no. Then one of the guys, Phil, jumped in to save her. Oh Once we knew they were okay... The party continued. Wow, that's quite a <laughs> drop. I don't know what that yeah. is. Like 30, it depends you know, what time of the year it was, I guess. I, you know, the, I was going to say, it's quite a drop into, at times, very, very shallow water. Damn. Uh, boy, that's dangerous. Oh. Uh, the party did continue. Uh, neither <laughs> Shelly or Phil are still with us. Rest in peace. Happy to share an incredible memory. Uh, that is an incredible memory. Yeah. I, I can't imagine. I walk across that bridge with Chauncey almost every day. I mean, we're yeah. out there constantly. And, of course, we look over both sides. He loves to just get his face in between the little poles, you know, on the, 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 the whatever you call that, the... You know, the thing that keeps you from falling in. Yeah, um, guardrail. Thank yeah. you. He, uh, he, you know, and we just, we walk back and forth, you know. And, and of course, uh, you can't help it. I'm a dude. So I think, could I make this fall? Could I survive the fall? <laughs> you know, and, and then I look down and in the summer, especially there's days when you just see the bottom right there. And I'm like, nah, that would no. be problematic. Man, I tell you what, if you're going to fall off that bridge, you want to have a keg nearby. You want to be half in the bag for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, you go limp, right? And I'm not even yeah. kidding around about that. I'm not encouraging it. But uh, I think of some of the falls and crashes and things I've done when I was drunk. And anything half that when you're sober, you tense up. And, and that's when you get hurt. That probably worked in their favor. But then again, 
uh, there again, you know, uh, try not to uh, avoid the falls from yeah. the bridge in the mist. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, doing that. That, uh, that reminds me, I, when I was in college, a bunch of us were out out in the woods having a drink up and there was a there was a, a creek and we were on like a, an overlook and it was a 20 or 30 foot, you know, cliff, if you will. And uh, our buddy Rokas, Rick Rokas, a Chicago guy, and he talked like the, uh, I can't even do the Chicago accent. It's so grinding. It grinds me down like chewing aluminum foil. But he had that hardcore Chicago and uh, the whole, this is this is mid-80s. So he was all about the Bears, and he went over to relieve himself off the edge of the cliff, and we heard just a, whoop. That was all he did. He went, whoop, like, whoop. It was like his version of an oop. And, uh, and everyone was like, what? Rick, he was right there a second ago, yeah. and we run over. It's dark, and we run over, and we're like, "Dude, are you okay?" And we just heard this, "Yeah, just gonna, just gonna be down here for a minute." And he had just, <laughs> it just felt like at least twenty feet. And he, but he tends to, he just, and he was a, a bodybuilder guy, not not like a Schwarzenegger body, but he just lifted power yeah. lifter constantly, and he just tensed up and 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 you know tucked in and hit, but he hit like it was soft. You know the the little bank there. It was soft yeah. mud, sort of sort of mud <laughs> dirt. And he was he was a little shook up, but no worse for the wear. I was like, man, that yeah. fall. I, I remember thinking like that would have killed me. And he just right. bounced up five minutes later. If you're peeing off the roof, someone's deck, uh, that's fine. You get right there to the edge. Uh, but uh, you're outdoors. You can step back a couple of feet from the cliff and pee on the ground. You'll, you'll still be fine. I'm sure he had that thought in retrospect. How many of these stories start with back in the 80s? Uh, uh, one more here yeah. before we move on from Roger on the KQ Facebook post. Back in the 80s, some friends were moving because the house they were renting had been sold, decided it would be a good time to clean a house, so they had a burn the furniture party <laughs> party. Uh, at some point, <laughs> burn the furniture party. Let's, you know, yeah. I hate winter party. Burn the, uh, who doesn't like a good theme? What was the one you were talking about? First one to pee? Uh, yeah, the bladder dead. bust. Yeah. The bladder bust. Well, at some point during the burning the party, burning party, someone threw in a small propane cylinder that still had some gas <laughs> in it. Oh, no. Yeah, all of a sudden we hear a hissing noise, then a boom. Uh, the fire is about 30 yards from the house. Items from the fire hit the house. Another friend sees the trailer full of garbage, so they figure might as well throw the garbage in the fire. They got too close. <laughs> The trailer catches fire, no time to unload. So a few days later, someone did drive past Roger Wright's and asked if they could buy what was left of the trailer. Thank goodness uh, the house didn't go up in the fire. Let's have a burn the furniture party. He would have burned the furniture parties like every Friday night in Richfield in the summer. We'd always have a (laughs) piece of furniture to burn, it seems. Really? Yeah. well, in South Minneapolis or the Nokomis, I lived over there for years, and we would always have a burn the Christmas tree party because you'd throw it in the backyard, and then here comes June and July, and that old crispy thing is still sitting in the backyard, and hey, you know what we should do? Uh, have a couple of beers and set this sucker on fire. I remember one time, uh, this just six-footer, dead, deader in hell, dry kindling, that sucker went up, uh, it must have been 50 feet in the air, I kid you not, flames, and the fire department did show up, someone called <laughs> the cops, and I ran, for some. it wasn't even my place, I'm like, yeah, guys, I'm just going to run on this one, sorry, good luck to you, but yeah, gr- burn the Christmas tree parties in summer, very popular. What, like I gotta ask Candace, what, what, what did furniture ever do to you? Why are we burning <laughs> we furniture all the time? We get ready or get rid of something, I feel, and the, yeah, that those furniture <laughs> yeah. makes the biggest fire. <laughs> I, I guess so. I, I, that's 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 news to me. Here's another one I got to share. Sorry. Uh, here it is. Back in the 80s from John. <laughs> God, man, what were we doing? Uh, me and three friends, Scott, Dave, and Jeff, were heading to a party in Duluth. As we were heading out of Minneapolis, there was a news segment coming on about Reagan's press conference covering the Libyan jets recently shot down by the Navy, which inspired me, dot, dot, dot. He goes... Quickly turning down the radio, I asked the guys if they'd heard about the press conference. They hadn't. So I made up a story about how Reagan was reinstating the draft since we were all 19 or 20. By the time we got to Duluth, I had all three totally convinced we were going to get drafted into the military, which worked out even better than I thought because at the party we went to by UMD, they started spreading the same information to others and totally deflated the festive mood. Everyone went from partying to dejectedly drinking and complaining about their lives are now ruined 
we have to go to the military all weekend long. When we got back to Minneapolis on Sunday, Scott was going to call his uncle, a Navy captain, to see if he could get a favorable assignment. <laughs> Dave and Jeff were going to head over to enlist so they could choose what they got, at which time I asked why and gave them the big reveal. I've never run so fast in my life. Oh, man. Oh, that is outstanding. I mean, from Friday, carrying it all the way to Sunday. He didn't have the internet. We didn't know what we didn't know. But oh, yeah, that is fantastic. On, on these pranks. I know. At Sandy, I'm just, I know. We could keep going. Thank you. <laughs> KQ Facebook post. Such a good read. Uh, Sandy living with a bunch of people at a house uh, going to St. Cloud State. A guest puts his head into the wall. One of those hoople heads, you know, where he rams the wall. Sure. But then he pukes down between the drywall. <laughs> oh, no. She never did get the stink out of that living room. Couldn't get in there to clean it up, and it was just, yeah, dried puke for a couple of weeks, hot summer, that kind of thing. Uh, thanks. Nice. These, we're not going to get to all these this morning. You want to check it out on the KQ Facebook page and have yourself a good laugh. Uh, you know, and- I, I when I was when I was in college, <laughs> I went I went to a uh, went to a party and it was a it was like a three bedroom apartment. I mean, a three room apartment, like a bedroom and then a living space and a kitchen, like like a you know, just a little bit bigger than like an efficiency. But of yeah. course, there's forty people crammed in there and this little three room apartment. And in one of the in in the little bedroom, there's a cam- like a camera, like a film camera showing, projecting an actual movie on the wall. And it's just straight up like 70s porn. And it's like, <laughs> it's like, like, like what I imagine they were doing, like in Boogie Nights, what Burt yeah. Reynolds was shooting in his basement, you know. And I, I had actually never seen real live porn. I mean, this is like 1983. And I was like, no, who has a film? Who has a camera that shows porn movies in their house? And I looked at it for a minute. I was like, wow. And but here's the thing: it was there was a bunch of art students, and it was very you know it was a she she little uh, party at a silly school. And there are folks in that room, and they're staring at it, and they're like you know they have that thing with their thumb and forefinger on their chin, like hmm, as they're just <laughs> contemplating. There's clove cigarettes are being smoked. It's like they're staring at a Jackson Pollock painting, and I was like, this is not art, you knuckleheads. You just got a heart on and you are and you don't want to talk about it and you're wondering how to talk to that girl over there with the hairy armpits and you're thinking this is going to help. What is wrong with you guys? Oh, man, I swear I have not thought about that in so long, but I could just, I could smell and see that whole scene oh. right in front of me and me looking at all them going, oh, come on. <laughs> it is what it is. It's your friend's cool dad's playboy and we're all nine still. Get yeah. over it. Yeah, no, isn't that the truth? Um, someone's going to have to call the cops on this party. I don't know if we're ever going to get to this career builders thing. We're going to move along here. Uh, maybe we will. Maybe you want to keep the party going with some weird party moments that uh, you're remembering. Maybe the 80s are starting to come back into focus or the 90s or whatever. 651-989-ROCK. That's our talking text line. We have something up on the KQ Facebook page as well. And who knows what's coming here at 830. Please hang tight. We'll find out together. Connect with us on the KQ Talk and Text Line, 651-989-ROCK. That's 651-989-ROCK. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. We have just been off in the ditch all morning with stories of insane party (laughs) moments, either parties that we hosted or attended or heard about. Everybody's got stories. And as we mentioned in the last segment, so many of them so far today started with Back in the 80s? Dot, dot, dot. Uh, Zep, you said you had another memory over the break. You said there was one more you wanted to share. What is it? Yeah, this one's 90s, but uh, we were out uh, hunting in Faith, South Dakota. My Sturgis buddies that uh, head out there from Minnesota will know Faith if they take the alternate route. Uh, a little roadside bar there. We're out, so you end up at the bar after you're done hunting, and we're, we're having a pretty good time. And somebody goes, hey, we're having a big party over at uh, so-and-so's place. So you drive out and literally in the, well, Faith is in the middle of nowhere. So now you're going into the middle of nowhere, nowhere. <laughs> now we get out to this ranch house out there, and, and we're having a good time. We're drinking a few beers, and it's a pretty a uh, loud, rowdy party. All of a sudden, uh, some guy comes out of one of the bedrooms wearing pajamas and a holster. And they go, uh-oh, fudge is up. 
Uh, look out, it's Fudge. And I'm like, Fudge? That's Fudge. Fudge comes stumbling out of his bedroom. I didn't see him drunk, but he was awfully pissed off. Uh, and apparently his roommate out on the deck, so he goes out on the deck. We're kind of following him now, the guy in the pajamas and the holster. And he pulls out the pistol and starts shooting. He goes, oh, you want to have a party? And starts shooting at his feet. His roommate <laughs> with the old dance routine they do out in the Wild West. Oh, my and, God. And that's when we decided we were out the front door. We uh, we split yeah. pretty quick on that deal. That one went south in a hurry. But, uh, yeah, first time I saw a guy in pajamas and a holster named Fudge. I don't, I don't think that... Anybody who is given the moniker Fudge, that that's <laughs> that is that is par for the course. The going to pull out the gun and and he's going to holster up over his PJs and start shooting at feet. That's a great nickname for a specific type of person. I'm there was a what where I grew up. There was a kid. There was one of the bad guys in our neighborhood. Uh, his his name was Chris Stevens, but he insisted that you call him his nickname, which had been given to him. But I, I made the mistake of saying Chris. He goes, you call me, and his nickname was Grub. <laughs> you call me Grub. And I'll, okay, Grub. Oh. That's that's right. That's up, a- but Fudge is, uh, you know, you <laughs> might think grub. Fudge, you might think Fudge has like there may be a friendlier connotation, but no, if if a kid is called Fudge, he's earned it, and it's not good. No, no, that's a 80s radio show, isn't it? Grub and Fudge in the morning? <laughs> Grub and probably. Fudge. How about Rebecca here on the KQ Facebook post? Uh, one night, me and my girlfriend just left the bar watching the strippers, Minnesota gals. I thought we'd go around the neighborhood and find a party because we usually know someone at a party. Uh, this one time we walked into the party, didn't recognize anyone, so we found the bathroom right away. And all we could hear were the guys yelling, the girls are here, the girls are here. They thought we were the strippers for the bachelor party that we had just wandered into. Strong. Strong. Trying to get out the bathroom window, but we couldn't, so we counted to three and ran for the door. Oh, my God. I thought she was going to say, but we couldn't, so we ended up putting on a hell of a show. (laughs) Yeah, and made some money. Well, man. Yeah, we had well, that. Uh, yeah, we had a buddy of mine one time. There's three of us that lived on the top floor of the house. Uh, we were football players there at Northern and Aberdeen, and on the main floor uh, were five gals that were on the basketball team. And we hear them having just a raging party down there. We're sitting up there feeling pretty sorry for ourselves, thinking, "How do how we not get invited downstairs for the party?" Pretty soon, we hear the tipper tapper up the stairs, knock on the door. Here we go. Now they want the guys to come down and join the party. No, they wanted one guy to come down and join the party because they were having a bachelorette party and they wanted someone to strip. And we're like, uh, you know, I, I was in my 20s. I probably had a few beers, but I wasn't feeling that outgoing. And But we did have one buddy there. He's crazy from Florida, played ball for us. And he's like, uh, and, and by the way, we had zero money. That's why we weren't out at the bars that night. We had not a penny to our name, couldn't pay sure. our rent. And they're like, we'll give you 300 bucks. And so we're like, yep, we'll send somebody down. We're like, Tony, dude, you got to go down and do this. We need 300 bucks. That pays our rent and takes care of everything. He's like, I'm not going. Do you, are you listening to that, Tony? I said, dude, you got to do it. He goes, well, and they wanted him to dress up. I had my uh, National Guard BDU camo. I'm like, here you go, buddy. Just bring it back. I've got to wear that to guard, you know, next weekend. So you got to bring all the pieces back. Don't lose anything. Don't let them rip it off you. Uh, we went down. It got much louder, much crazier. He came upstairs, a look with that two thousand yard stare, like PTSD. Handed us oh, the three hundred dollars, marched into the bedroom, and didn't say anything the rest of the night. But we paid rent. That well, was a wild one. Yeah, no kidding. But I mean, I mean, you, you buried the lead. The rent was paid. Who cares what he suffered? <laughs> yeah, right. Trauma. <laughs> Well, homelessness is trauma, dude. We got the rent covered. <laughs> Deal with it. <laughs> exactly. Take a hit for the team for crying out loud. Um, hey, it's January 10th. I already mentioned that. January 8th, a couple days ago. Um, well, well, you know what? It, put it this way. If, if you're still uh, if you're still married, if you're still in a, in a committed relationship, yeah. then, 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 then well done. Because Monday, <laughs> January 8th, one of the biggest days of the years uh, for separation and then ultimately divorces. Oh, yeah. uh, there's a lot of studies. This is the thing every year. You make it through the holidays together, but for a lot of people, suddenly things turn up. You know, holidays just ratchet up whatever you're feeling. If it's all about warmth and love and family, you feel even more of that. If there's cracks in the foundation of a relationship the holidays tend to bring those more to like uh you know wide rifts as opposed to cracks 
The holidays can be awful, and now it's cold, and you don't have holidays to look forward to. There's a bunch of debt because you overspent, and people think, I, I got to make a change. And literally, this second week of January is when it all goes down, and January 8th is usually when it peaks. Money problems, number one, but then there's also intimacy, uh, sex problems mm. in relationships. Uh, suffice to say, or what I'm getting at is, if you're still together, then you did good. You got through, <laughs> uh, you know, sniper's alley for relationships, which is uh, apparently it comes to a head January 8th. Are we all still? Are we all still good? We're still. Are we still connected to the people we entered the holiday season with? Yeah, yep. solid as a rock. I mean, uh, right. she held my hair while I puked out some mm-hmm. glue, so. Uh, uh, not really, but did drive me eight hours home while I did. No, I uh, survived it. Um, one of my buddies, um, however, did not. Uh, he's in a hotel right now. He got drunk on Christmas Eve and told his wife, I love you so much. I just feel terrible. I cheated on you three years ago. Oh, I'm like, dude, geez. what did you, why would you, but that's good, honest, but yeah, mm. he's still staying in a hotel. I just checked in with him a couple of days ago and he's, oh, we're going we're gonna to be fine. We're going we're gonna to get some counseling, but I see what you say. Yeah. Yeah. The holidays, they, they, they play with our emotions and our sentimentality and then you add in a little booze and some good food and yikes yeah you just uh, i can tell you this right there i can tell you this the the difference between that couple and uh and the gormans is if anything like that ever happened if there was a reason where we separated i wouldn't be at the hotel my wife would she'd be like oh no no i'm going to the hotel (laughs) you take care of the pets i'm gonna get i'm gonna get a massage i'm gonna enjoy nice long quiet (laughs) baths without interruption i'm gonna get room service no you stay at home dude you deal with the pet hair that would that would be how that would go down it makes you feel any better he's staying at a place called the breeze inn (laughs) <laughs> wow yeah breeze in stumble yeah. out man <laughs> yeah exactly that so, is I'm rough sure, sure those crazy kids will be all right but yeah it's it's well we talked about it on monday right i mean it was in its uh oh it's dating sunday or something like that everybody's out there dating and and going crazy yeah the and- dating apps light up this week as as people separate they get right back into the game Oh, uh, you know, they, they're like, OK, I'm done with you. Uh, the holidays have shown that we aren't supposed to be together. So let me go find someone else to annoy. Right. You know, there was uh, we were talking about one of the they're all weird. There's one called Bristle. If you just want to meet a dude or a gal with whiskers, you know, whatever your thing is there. <laughs> but uh, and we we're talking about there was a dating app just for threesomes. You know, right. I don't know if it's a swinger app or if it's three strangers getting together. I don't know if you saw this trailer that dropped yesterday for Peacock's Couple to Thruple, a new dating show. It's where couples decide whether or not to add a third member to their relationship. This is coming to Peacock along with you know, the Miami Kansas City football game. Uh, Peacock. Peacock. Like like Couple NBC, like like good old family and Peacock. Yeah. Peacock, you're in wow. the trailer right here. Couple to thruple. If you were given the chance at non-monogamy in paradise, what would you do? Four curious couples will be given the unique opportunity to turn that fantasy into a reality. Okay. I've never been on a date with three people. It's kind of like our first time dating as a couple. We make a good team. Check. Let's go. We would like to invite... With a bed big enough for three... I'm tapped out. Last night, it was just like, What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> oh, my God. Peacock getting into the smut business. All right. Yeah. Know. Okay. It, Fair enough. I suppose it's that time. I, you know, I hadn't thought about it for a while, but January is, uh, yeah, you know, people are getting into new things, out of the old things, experimenting. Look out. Who knew January was so much fun? These these can be very stressful times, but for people who are still attached at the hip to their partner, check this out. A new study from the University of British Columbia says that when women are feeling anxious or stressed, I'm going to pause for the inherent joke I'm not saying. When women are feeling anxious or stressed, they will immediately feel calmer if they smell their significant other's shirt. Oh. <laughs> the one I've been wearing the entire break. <laughs> Researchers found when women smelled their partner's shirt, they had a drop in their cortisol levels, oh. which are connected to stress. Women who didn't smell a shirt 
had higher cortisol levels. Uh, they did not test whether men would get the same benefits from smelling their partner's clothes. I can tell you the answer. You get the same benefit from smelling a partner's clothes if they are bringing you a plate of nachos. <laughs> or if they've just put, whipped a steak out of the, you know, right off the grill. But generally yeah. speaking, no. But for women, just the smell of your partner's shirt can lower your anxiety. Isn't that nice? That's like, uh, I, I, I think about when people say like, oh, if you're feeling stressful or on a regular basis, just get a fish tank. I just think that, that, that alone, I, you know what I would, if, if I had decided I need to get a fish tank, tropical fish to calm down my anxiety, uh, the, the thought of buying and dealing with that, where like introducing myself to a whole new sector of society, <laughs> the tropical fish world that would that would go ahead whatever stress i was having would just magnify by mil a million percent not for everyone i guess i'm just thinking to myself you know i do i'm a little bit of a slob especially when it comes to my shirts because i, I like flannels over a t-shirt that's my thing that's what i rock and i come in and i throw the shirt on the couch on the chair on the over the banister or whatever and now i've got a, a great comeback honey I just thought you looked a little stressed, and I wanted to leave some of my dirty shirts laying around. <laughs> Had a boy. Just, sure just grab one and take a big, and just let it all, like a Calgon bath, let it all just go away. We should all smell each other's shirts the next time we're together and see what happens. <laughs> well, I guess, I guess the significant other can also work with work relation. I mean, I mean, for work purposes, we're all very significant to each other. Let's get, yeah, let's figure that out. But do me a favor. Just for my own, please tell me ahead of time so I can be prepared. I don't, don't, don't sneak in the whole, oh, let me smell your shirt, Steve. I just want to be, you know, I, I'd be embarrassed if it had been one of those three day jags where I just kept forgetting to change clothes <laughs> yeah, as, as, as I'm want, as I'm want to do. Yeah, not on a Monday morning during the playoffs because, you know, I'm not changing my clothes for the weekend. Uh, for now, we have a sit-down job. You know, we're not sweaty people by name. We're not working our asses off. So, yeah, I'll let it slide for a day or or tree. Hey, speaking um, of the playoffs, Zep, you yeah. said on Monday, you called your shot. You said the Packers, who are a <laughs> seven and a half point underdog, will go to Dallas and beat the Cowboys. And my my man, I am hearing a whole lot of chatter where people are looking at that particular game going there because wild card weekend, there's always one pretty significant upset. Always. And yeah. that's the one people are looking at going, I could totally see this happening. The pressure the Cowboys are going to be feeling, the fact that, that Jerry Jones will not commit to McCarthy, he's starting to talk vague about yeah. the future, all the pressure, 100% of the pressure in that game is on the Cowboys, and you got this young Packer team with a young quarterback they're confident and they don't know enough to be nervous and they're smart enough to go in there with a bag full of house money and they might just pull it off. So you may you may come out of this week, you know, looking like John Madden himself, my man. <laughs> well, it was uh, just kind of, you know what, I had been watching a couple of Cowboys games down the stretch here as I have a couple of Packers games. Maria's a big Packer fan and, uh, you know, I just watching them and it wasn't any great insight, but I thought everyone is telling this Packers team, you haven't got a shot in hell. Dallas is unbeatable. I mean, literally unbeatable at home. Not only are they unbeatable, but they tend to trounce people yeah. uh, with that offense at home. They've got a great defense. There's no chance in hell the Packers are going to win this game, which is why I think maybe the NFL does it to us at least once or twice a year, right? Mm -hmm. I think maybe here in the playoffs. Uh, you know, I'm going to put a little, I'm going to get on my, um, I always forget my sporting app name. It's, uh, 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 uh one of my coworkers turned me on to it. It's right here. I'm underdog. Underdog my, fantasy, baby. I've already been on underdog, uh, you know, given the love to love and some of the Packers players and my pick them five. So uh, we'll I will like see. It. And if, if I lose, I'm just a, you know, a dumbass morning broadcaster that didn't know what he was talking about in the first place. But you know, who does know what they're talking about. And there's a lot to talk about in the Vikings offseason. Another Viking icon, Vicon Jared Allen, has been piping in about there are going to be some quarterbacks laying around for the 11th pick for the mm. Vikings this year. Kirk Cousins, of course, coming off the injury, free agency, yeah. all that good jazz. We're going to be talking with the man himself, Robert Smith, here at 9 o'clock. Hang tight. It's the KQ Morning Show. 92 KQRS. Zip. Tony. Candace and Steve Gorman are the KQ Morning Show. 
92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. Wednesday, January the 10th. Robert Smith will be joining us in just a couple of minutes. We'll talk about the Viking season that was and the playoff season just now beginning. Always good to check in with the Vicon himself, Robert Smith. Hey, uh, speaking of two tickets to Paradise, Zep, the 11th annual Tee It Up golf card goes on sale Friday at 9 a.m., you can golf at six area courses. You can save $175 doing it. Get yours at 92kqrs.com. Search the keyword golf, 92kqrs.com. Oh, oh, I am excited for <laughs> yeah. golf 2024. That's just nice to talk about in January, isn't it? I mean, it it's is. It's like uh, sinking your toes in the sand. It just feels good thinking about I, golf. Uh, I waited until October of 23 to get the clubs out for some odd reason. Uh, It was a a year of adjustments for me. Let's just put it that way. (laughs) But then uh, up up there in Brainerd Way, you and I played a round of golf. And then then I came back down and played uh, the following week uh, here uh, right in Minneapolis. And man... I boy, that's just been itching ever since. I'm dying to get back out, and I know it's going to be it's going to be a minute, but it's just going to be it'll be a couple minutes. But that's all it's going to be, and I cannot wait to uh, to to really take far more advantage of the great golf in the area this summer. Yeah, oh, I man, go. Yes, you want to go, Candace? Yeah, I mean, I'm I think I'm really good at golf, and I don't know it because <laughs> I did mini golf when I was in Arizona. Okay, um, last weekend, and I got two holes in one. Okay. Right after one another. And the first one, the crowd just went wild. The crowd? Wild. Yep, everyone what? was watching and it what was crowd? crazy. <laughs> you know, it was PGA like a big crowd. outdoor, Miles it was along. a Tiger Woods, uh, I forgot what it's called. They had like a putt, putt bar thing in Arizona. Well, this sounds like fun. Yeah, it was so fun. And um, yeah, I was like, I'm going to get a hole in one. And then I did. And right. everyone you was free- like, Woo! You forgot what it was called. It was like a, you know, putt em call it. Yeah, that's cute. It was something like putt, putt house, putt party, party putt. Nice. <laughs> Just night putting. Just putting at night. Isn't that a line from Caddyshack? Yeah, um, I, it is. I, I oh, believe it she is. she just passed away, the actress. Uh, oh, Cindy t- Morgan. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. Lacey, uh, what's her name? Lacey Underall? Lacey Underall? <laughs> something like that. In, in the movie? Yeah, yeah. man. Um, yeah. yeah, that I, I I did not just come up with the name Putcher McCall. That was actually uh, there was a miniature golf course uh, when I was in high school. My brother was in college, and he got a job at a at a miniature golf course under construction. And they had a contest for someone to name the place, and he came up with Putcher McCall. It and and that's what they went with. And his uh, reward was free mini golf for life. The place was closed within like six months. Oh, but for you, those six months, we were rocking it. I mean, how do you drive past a putt? You might call it. I mean, if I'm busy, I'm, I'm on the, you know, I, I've got a tight schedule. I've got to stop for a little putt. You might call it. That's a, that's a good one. Well, Candace, if you've got your uh, putting game down, uh, you're halfway there, I think, probably. You had to come on out with us. We'll get ourselves some uh, KQ golf cards, and we'll just wear those suckers out. Yeah, it's just endless great golf around and, the And, country. Candace, I'll go ahead and answer your question now. Yes, you can drive the cart. Oh, hell yeah. I'm good at driving carts, man. That's your bag? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you I'm also really right. good at golf. I just, I think, I think it's just one of those All things right. that I just have to unleash the beast, you know? In addition right. to being a uh, top shelf broadcaster and an icon of Vikings days past, the Vicon himself, Robert Smith, is a hell of a golfer, or at least he was at one time, and he joins us right now on a KQ Morning Show. Uh, what What's the status of the golf game these days, Robert? Terrible. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Come on. It's brutal, man. When I was living in Florida before my daughter was born, uh, you know that my daughter's thirteen now. Yeah, I was golfing three, four times a week. Yeah, and now I might golf three, four times a year my own ball. So yeah, it's a little different. But 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 I guarantee you, you're still getting around. You're still making nice contact. You're striking the ball well, though. On a, it comes back though, right? Uh, oh boy, yeah, you go ahead and believe that if you want. <laughs> All right, fair enough. I'm trying to give I, you. I always, I always say it. People are going to lie about you. Might as well be a compliment. That's a very good point. That's a very good point. Well, let's um let's not tell any lies about the Viking season that we just uh, endured. We along with the Vikings enduring just one tough break after another. And before we talk about this year's Vikings, I'm looking at your stint with the team. 
if memory, if, I mean, if if what I'm reading is correct, you never had a losing season. You only went eight and eight once, correct? Yeah, we went eight and eight, and we had a chance to make it into the playoffs going into that game. Oh, uh, oh, the last game of the season, really? Yep. Oh, and obviously that that did not go according to plan. So uh, that's your worst season. Still, it's eight and eight. I'm looking at it right now. A loss to the Bengals at Riverfront. Ooh. That's a that's gonna that's a, that's a sting that'll linger. But what's what's the feeling then? You've never endured, so you never had a season like the one the Vikings just had, where it just seemed like you know you're just getting kicked in the shins over and over and over. But that said, um, wh- what do you remember about that season eight and eight? At the end of the season, packing up, getting ready, was there a feeling of of you know was there a despondent uh, view in the locker room? What what's it like when the season ends and you don't get to the postseason? Yeah, I mean, it's a bad feeling, but, you know, you had your opportunities during the season and you really just start thinking about the next year. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I had ended the end of the season with an ankle injury and um, didn't even play in that last game. So, uh, you know, I was hoping to get a chance to play in the playoffs and I was just thinking about getting healthy and getting to that next year. You know, it's the nature of the business. Um, right. You just have to be ready for what's next. So uh, let's talk about what's next for this Viking team. First things first, do you think Brian Flores is going to get some head coaching calls? Uh, Yeah, I do. Um, You know, obviously the end of the season didn't go quite as well as the beginning of the season did. Mm -hmm. But, you know, his situation is complicated with the lawsuit against the NFL. I don't know how that would play in uh, to any negotiations with teams, but uh, I think he's certainly going to get some looks. Um, I've heard people suggest that the Vikings need to do all they can to hang on to him, go so far as to give him a, an assistant head coach uh, moniker, if you will, you know, really beef him up. Do you think that's something that's worth doing? If you're the Vikings, do you hold on to Flores or do you, um, I mean, I mean, is he worth going to the mat for like that? I think that he is. I mean, you know, you, you look at what he did with, a, you know, a group of new players this season, you know, looking at what happened with Ed Donatello a year ago, you know, I think the way that he used his scheme, just very creative. I mean, he, they led the league in blitzing at least a couple weeks before the end of the year, mm-hmm. but they also led the league in drop eight. So they really uh, confused opposing quarterbacks. And, you know, for most of the year with that personnel, which wasn't great at every level. And, you know, certainly I think they need some help at cornerback. They need some help along that defensive line. He, he put up some pretty good numbers. Or they put up some pretty good numbers. So you have to be impressed with what he was able to do. Robert, we talked a lot about that very improved defense. Obviously, once Cousins went down, there was a, a blip of hope uh, with Josh Dobbs. You know, throughout the season, we're waiting for Jeff- Jefferson to come back. Addison had a great rookie campaign. What's a real uh, feather in the cap? What's something Viking fans can feel good about that we didn't pay a lot of attention to? Is there a player that the average fan is, you know, is there a is there a safety or a lineman that you saw? Anything that you are like, oh, you guys aren't paying attention to this, and this is something that's really positive going into next year? Yeah, well, I would say at right guard, Eddie Ingram looked a lot better than he did in year one, you know, Mm -hmm. in his rookie campaign. So that's something to be positive about. We'll see if at left guard, if they're going to get Dalton Reisner back and uh, Bradbury back at center. But, you know, you have some pieces to build on. Derrissaw is all pro level uh, tackle, uh, you know, and and, and we know what O'Neal is like. So uh, I think those pieces are in place. The real question is, what are you going to do at quarterback? Oh boy, you're not kidding. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I it, that that Achilles for Cousins, and Achilles is never a, an easy or fun thing to come back from. But at his age, uh, I I imagine it's even even tougher. Um, I mean, let's just put you're the GM for the day. What's your gut tell you? What what should the Vikings do in that regard? Well, for, from all indications, I don't know if this is true, but from all indications, he's willing to go below market to come back to the team. I think yeah. you still need to draft a quarterback, but you can't do any better than mm. having a guy like Kirk Cousins around a young quarterback. So I think that you make the investment that probably gets a deal done with Justin Jefferson, maybe even slightly below market, and he's going to create a new market. Mm-hmm. So you have to think about how all of those pieces fit together.
Yeah, you know, uh, one of your teammates, another Viking great, uh, Jared Allen, came out and said, eh, I thought they had to move on. You know, it gave his two cents, uh, move on and draft a quarterback. You make a great point if uh, Kirk is willing to come down a little bit and uh, and give the Vikings some wiggle room there. They have the 11th pick in the draft. This isn't a loaded quarterback class um you're probably looking at a Penix or maybe a McCarthy just won the national championship uh, uh quarterback uh, hanging around there for that 11th pick uh not in other words not a quarterback that's going to come out uh the NFL draft and be ready to go game one you know after a little bit of a preseason if you can keep Cousins around win some games you know provide some uh, leadership on the team and get this new quarterback started because as a fan that's what you're doing right now as a Viking fan I'm going well now it's all about the draft what are we going to do with the draft adolfo mensa is this his third draft now uh, clearly his second so expecting you know a good draft here uh where do you start besides the quarterback for the minnesota vikings where do they need to what do they need to start drafting you know i think they need to go cornerback again and again probably something along that defensive line you know that's something that uh you know, I'm expecting to see, but you know, just because you're at 11 doesn't mean you stay at 11. Really expensive, I think, to move up into that top three because you know you're talking really about Caleb Williams, you're talking about Drake May, and you're talking about Jaden Daniels, and they're probably going to go, you know, three of the top five at the very least, maybe even the top three. So it would mm. be expensive to move up, but I wouldn't rule out a move like that as well. Yeah. Robert Smith is with us on the KQ Morning Show. All right, um, enough of the Vikings. Uh, we, we discussed them all season long. Let's look ahead uh, quickly now. You saw uh, a lot of these playoff teams. You saw a lot of teams in person. And then, of course, like the rest of us watching when you weren't calling games. Um, do you look at this playoff picture on either side, AFC or NFC, and see a, an underdog? Do you see a team that you're like, you know what, they're going to come out and shock some people? Hmm. You know, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, you know, I was surprised to see Pittsburgh even make it in. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, with uh, with Mason Rudolph at quarterback, you know, the, the offense has certainly seemed to look different uh, on the AFC side. And, of course, Buffalo surprised where they were with about five games left to make it in. So uh, on the AFC, they're a bit of a surprise. And I wouldn't be surprised to see the L.A. Rams um upset Detroit right, yeah. uh, this weekend as well. You know, they were, they're another one of those teams that, you know, second half of the season kind of got things uh, together and really, um, really turned it around. Yeah, they certainly did. We haven't had a chance to speak, Robert, since Joe Flacco came off the bench <laughs> with Cleveland. I mean, can you believe that great defense now has, of all people, Joe Flacco uh, taking them down to Houston for what I think is going to be a pretty entertaining game? Yeah, it should be a really entertaining game. And with that defense, you know, they're all world. And, of course, you know, what a great story with the Texans and C.J. Stroud, what he's become. But Tank Dell, their top receiving threat, been lost for the last few weeks of the year. So, mm-hmm. yeah, that should be an incredible game. Yeah, you uh, you saw the Texans a couple times this year, didn't you? Yeah, at least three. Yeah, um, Stroud, boy, I mean, I mean, it, it gets better in hindsight, his rookie year and looking at the numbers, I don't think anybody could have seen that coming, which again, always, always points out the fact that this quarterback thing, it's, it's such a crap shoot. I mean, I mean, the experts, the guys who spend their lives trying to figure this out, nobody saw CJ Stroud coming like this, did they? No, I don't really think anybody saw this. I thought that they they felt that he was deserving, you know, of that t- of that second pick. But nobody really saw this. But you're absolutely right. I mean, you know, look at the Jets. We had the Jets this past weekend against mm-hmm. uh, the Patriots, and I got some good music stories too for that. Um, but uh, <laughs> you know, you, you you look at what the Jets had done with Sam Darnold, and then you do the same thing with Zach Wilson. There are just no guarantees, even at the top five position at quarterback. Yeah, no question about. It. Oh, if you got a good music story, lay it on us. What do you got? Yeah, so the the very first concert that Bill Belichick went to was the Letterman, uh, but his parents didn't go to that one. But his the first concert that he chose was Iron Butterfly. So in <laughs> got a Vita. <laughs> yes, <laughs> didn't see that coming. And, wow. And, uh, you know, 
as an aside to that era in music, I think um, I think uh, Iron Butterfly made their debut in like '68. Yeah. But 1967. You know, I tweeted about this I, I, incredible year for debut albums. It was David Bowie. It was Al Green, Isaac Hayes, Jimi Hendrix, Pink Floyd, Jeez. and um, uh, The Doors. All uh, in oh. all in 1967. Can you imagine a year oh, yeah. of music that had better debut albums? That's uh, that's not bad at all. Um, and I and I love the I love young Bill Belichick. Just I'm picturing him in a dashiki. <laughs> you know, got some got some feathers in his hair. Yeah, that's right. fantastic. I want to hear <laughs> Belichick. I I would I would pay money. In fact, someone will probably do this with AI. But I want to hear him press conference. Bill just going in a gotta Davida, honey. Don't you know that I'm loving you? In a gotta Davida, just 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 go down all the lyrics to in a gotta. Oh, won't you come with me and take my hand? Won't you come with me and walk this land? That'd be great. It's fantastic. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, the- hey, my my oldest sister in law. Uh, Bunny Gorman, Bunny Gibson as a kid in Annapolis, Maryland, a schoolmate of Bill Belichick, and in fact, prom date of Bill Belichick. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah, I shared his, I have his sixth grade school photo if you want. I'll show it to you (laughs) off the air. Yeah. Yeah. They they grew up in Annapolis together. Um, So, uh, hey, hey, uh, Robert, uh, first things first. For, for this whole season, man, I can't thank you enough. It's been awesome having you on uh, every week. This week, it's Wednesday, not Monday. But these Mondays have been a real highlight for all of us. So thank you very much for that. Yes. Uh, first things first. And we certainly hope that you'll be uh, interested in doing this again next season. On top of that, uh, Zepp just mentioned earlier, looking at that 11th pick for the Vikings, uh, a quarterback he mentioned, what was his name? J.J. McCarthy got a, a natty for, hang on, I'm look, I'm oh, yeah. look, checking I'm checking my notes. Oh, that's right. <laughs> Michigan came through uh, Monday night. Any thoughts on the Michigan-Washington game? Or as I call oh, it, man. the beatdown in Houston. Man, just, uh, just uh, so impressed with what Jim Harbaugh has been able to do. I mean, you know, every, every, everybody knows he's quirky. I've always liked him, played against him when he was with the Bears. Uh, you know, a, a gritty guy, did great at San Diego, did great uh, when he was at Stanford. He came up with the best, one of the best lines that I've ever heard when he was at Stanford. He said, we're going to win with character and cruelty. And then he does the satellite <laughs> camps That's and the great. foreign trips. Yeah. has all kind of crazy quotes. He said, uh, if, if worms had guns, birds wouldn't be scared of them. And I still don't know what that means. But, you know, <laughs> sure. it's just, he's just he's just done it the right way. And I think the most important thing that he did was change the defensive philosophy. You know, yeah. he had Don Brown, Dr. Blitz on the defensive side, got rid of him, went to his brother and said, hey, you know, I need some help on the defensive side. And so he gets Mike McDonald. He gets, uh, Je- you know, he, he talked about Jesse Minner. Minner goes to Vanderbilt. McDonald goes to Michigan one season, and John Harbaugh's like, hey, man, I want him as my D coordinator. I'm yeah. getting my, yeah. rid of my blitz happy guy in Martindale. So he brings Mike McDonald there, and then uh, Michigan brings in Jesse Minner. You know, and they just they played a much better scheme, and I think that's what really revealed itself mm-hmm. in the national championship game. Nothing cheap, nothing deep. You know, it's the Fangio style. You have two, three deep players, and you force guys to make decisions. Uh, you know, to, to get the ball underneath, and you confuse them with simulated pressures, with four man rushes, and Penix just didn't show up. And yeah. I would be concerned about taking Penix at eleven from what I, what I saw in that game. Oh, really? You think it was that? It, and you, I, I, if you're thinking that, I'm sure other people are too. That impactful, huh? Oh, I, I think so. Wow, that's pretty intense. Um, speaking of Harbaugh being his own guy. With the entire world assuming he's going to the NFL, I have this feeling because of what you just described, the guy you just described, I wouldn't be at all surprised if he just completely says, nah, I'm staying in Ann Arbor. Well, but the reason I think he wants to go back to the pros is he not only lost the Super Bowl, he lost it to his brother. So, you know, he has <laughs> yeah, to achieve at the pinnacle of the game. Um, and I, I, I think, you know, he wants to go back to the pros to do it. You know what? That's a beautiful moment after they beat Washington where the two Harbaugh brothers have a big hug and they're all smiles. And you're exactly right. But, of course, what he thinks is, I'm coming for you next, Jack. Watch out. (laughs) 
<laughs> that's that's good brotherly love right there. Robert, again, thank you for everything this season, man. It's always a pleasure. And if you find yourself in the uh, up in Minnesota this year, bring the sticks with you, would you? All right. Sounds we'll, good, my man. We'll, we'll get out and hit him. Thanks, Robert. Right. Robert oh. Smith right there. Uh, man, I tell you what, that's uh, – Oh, I'm so happy we had Robert all season. That was a blast, wasn't it? Connect with us on the KQ Talk and Text Line, 651-989-ROCK. That's 651-989-ROCK. 92 KQRS. I'm Steve Gorman. This is the KQ Morning Show. It's Wednesday, January the 10th. Uh, That song, Autograph, Turn Up the Radio. If you're working out and you need a little boost, just turn up your electric pants. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else so, thinking of the electric cowboy? My mom loved that song. Was that the one with uh, Robert Redford? He'd oh, the movie, your... Electric Cowboy, yeah. Yeah, right, exactly. I'm thinking of his electric pants or something like that, maybe. When I, when I say when I say the word pants like that, I immediately think of, like, that would be something Paul Lind on a Hollywood Squares. That would be one of his answers. It's like, yeah. you know, where did... Uh, where did he hide his telescope? And he'd go <laughs> in his pants. <laughs> um, sorry, that's just a weird, random, sleep-deprived thought I just had. Really, Paul, did- Paul Lind was gold on the Hollywood Squares, though, wasn't he? Do you know that today, I just read this on uh, whatever it is now, Twitter X, uh, this morning, Paul Lind mysteriously drowned on this day in 1982. Are you serious? This mm. is the anniversary of his death in his swimming pool. Uh, they think it might have been under the influence of alcohol or something. Maybe a heart attack. Actually, not only did I, I not know that was today, I had no idea that he drowned. Yeah, it is. Wow. Cool. Yeah, did the uh, Brian Jones, I guess. Brian Jones disease. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> but uh, when, Thur- when Thurman Munson of the New York Yankees died in a plane crash, my brother told me the news. He goes, did you hear Thurman Munson died? And I go, oh, my God, what happened? And he goes, it's so sad. He died of Buddy Holly's disease. Um, I'm sorry. I just, come on. It's funny. It's dark, but it's funny. It's been long enough. No, here's my electric pants uh, reference. <laughs> the consumer electric, uh, the consumer electronics show that's happening in Vegas. This is the, the thing that happens every January and all the companies bring out their new gadgets. There are a new pair of workout pants that deliver tiny electric shocks while you exercise. Oh. Well, yeah, why? I knew why? I'd get a oh, a breathy <laughs> whoa from Candace. Sounds fun. They apparently reduce <laughs> fatigue by six percent and up your performance by as much as thirty percent. Wow! Well, I mean, like if you start uh, dragging ass, it's going to shock you or something. <laughs> it's okay. This says uh, the, these electrified clothes do work, but they don't. It's not like the ones where. You know, you sit there and watch movie and some weird belt runs around your thigh and works through your cellulite. No, this is, you have to be working out, but apparently this works. The company is called We Stim, uh, and the shocks are so slight, you actually don't feel them. There's a tiny bit of silver attached, uh, stitched into the, stat to take the static electricity from your own movement, and it oh. delivers a microcurrent to your muscles. Okay, this is where I start to feel like the con is on. Yeah. Uh, but but they are saying it does the job. It reduces fatigue by 6%, and it does. Even though you don't feel the stimulation and the shock, it boosts your workout performance up to 30%, 60 to $100, depending oh. on the style uh, for these this, these this pair of pants. Yeah. I want the bell bottoms. Um, well, that's not bad because, I mean, I'm at that age now, man. <laughs> bell I'm bottoms. Looking for an edge. I'm looking for an edge on anything. I'm willing to uh, take a gamble on some snake oil. I think because, yeah, you know, it's still trying to ski and a hike out there and it's, you know, the muscles just turn into mush. I need some sure. help. I might get these. What, what's the name of the company again? We Stem. We I'm, stem, I'm looking. Right. Right, now, I don't now I don't see that. I don't see assless chaps on here. So <laughs> well, I can make the, I got but, a pair of scissors. <laughs> but bell bottoms. Yeah, that's just a matter. That's just a matter of time. I'm sure. If they don't have them yet, they'll get them soon enough. Um, get well, Tony Lee. We miss you, brother. Hopefully, yes. Tony's back uh, back on the horse tomorrow. Um, and uh, and 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 if not, then we'll be here again, and and then we'll continue to wish him all the best. Hell, I wish him well, even if he is well. <laughs> we miss you, Tony. Let's look back. How about a history lesson? On this day in 1962, the NFL entered into a single network agreement with CBS. CBS said we want all of your regular season games and the nfl said no problem you better bring that checkbook and in 1962 
to telecast every game was four point six million dollars. <laughs> wow! Well, sixty-two. Uh, that's a big yeah, it's goal. a that's a lot of money back then. However, remember this coming weekend, the Chiefs and Dolphins will play a wild card game on Peacock. Peacock paid $110 million for that one game. Oh, wow. Yeah, $4 million got CBS the entire league. That is pretty strong. Get the KQ Morning Show podcast wherever you listen. 92 KQRS.